The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Last spring, the city of New York unveiled Vision 2020, New York City's comprehensive waterfront plan, which is, in their words, a 10-year vision for the future of the city's 520 miles of shoreline, providing a sustainable framework for more water transport, increased public access to the waterfront, and economic opportunities that will help make the water part of New Yorkers' everyday lives. Well, we've got a couple of experts in the studio who have been involved in the process, ready to talk about what this means for us here in the Bronx. We're not taking phone calls tonight because of MLK Day, but you can weigh in with questions or comments via email to bronxtalk at hotmail.com, and we'll read those on a future edition of our program. So please join me in welcoming back to Bronx Talk the Director of Programs for the New Waterfront Alliance, Metropolitan, Metropolitan excuse me, Waterfront the Alliance. new Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance, Courtney Worrell. What a way to begin, huh? <laughs> and uh, the project director for uh, the comprehensive waterfront plan at the New York City Department of Planning, Michael Morella. Good evening, Mr. Morella. Thank evening. you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, start in uh, with you, Mr. Morella. What is this plan that I've introduced? Why do we need it? And what have you ultimately turned out uh, for the city of New York and the people of the Bronx? Right. Well, the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan, as you mentioned, is a 10-year vision for the city's waterfront. And it is intended to take advantage of one of the most important resources that we have, the waterfront and waterways. We're a city that was built because of our waterfront and connections to our harbor. And over time, a lot of the city has lost connections with that waterfront, and we're now providing the impetus and the direction for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how the plan was developed. You were telling me briefly just before the show that it, it took a comprehensive amount of study and a comprehensive amount of work. So who was involved and how did you do it? That's right. So it started actually at this point, probably close to about three years ago, where staff from the Department of City Planning spent over a year analyzing what's happening on our waterfronts and in our waterways, where staff literally walked virtually every single inch of the city's waterfront, all 520 miles, to really begin to assess what's happening, where are their opportunities, where are their challenges. Mm -hmm. From that, we began a public process, a year-long participatory planning process that we worked with communities throughout all five boroughs, holding workshops in each of the boroughs to solicit the, the feedback from the public. Give, give me a sense of when you had your team of folks walking around or driving around, getting around, maybe even using ferries for that a matter. combination of it all. Yeah, get, getting around the city. Give me a sense of the problems and things they said, wait a minute, this is the kind of thing we need to address. Sure. Well, it's uh, here in the Bronx, there are many good examples of the challenges that we face on the waterfront. Um, if you were to look in the Riverdale, in Riverdale, for instance, we have a transit line, the Amtrak and Metro North lines, running directly parallel and on the shore of the Hudson River. And that makes it a significant challenge to provide access to the public to the waterfront itself. There are couple, with the relatively few exceptions, that waterfront is largely cut off from the community. Um, so that's just one example. Um, certainly looking at being able to use our water, uh, waterways themselves for movement of goods uh, is something that we recognize as a big challenge as well. To, to increase economic development and those kinds of things, why not? Absolutely, as well as the economic and environmental benefits that come with moving our goods by water. Um, we have already crowded roads and rails and moving goods by water would, uh, would help alleviate that. And then on, on, uh, I'm gonna just throw in one more. Um, one would think simply the beautification of them and the, the notion of parkland and if you have a waterfront that's kind of spoiled 
a riverside, and we have many of them in the Bronx that are not none too pretty, uh, I, I suppose you would want to take a look at that and say, you know what, let's make it so people want to kind of be here. That's absolutely right. Making it an attractive destination for the public was first and foremost. We're, we'll bring uh, Courtney into the dialogue in a moment. I will, just using that Riverdale uh, a train line as an example. So here you have uh, engineers and planners taking a look at that saying, hmm, this isn't a very good thing. What is the kind of thing that you would do to, at least from a planning standpoint, to alleviate that or change it around so that it's accessible right. and usable? Well, in Riverdale, it's it's one of the hardest examples um, because of, you know, it's, it's far, it's cost prohibitive to think about either moving that rail line or burying it. But there are select sites where we could look at providing access along the waterfront at very select sites. So the Riverdale train station, for instance, there might be an opportunity there of getting outboard of the train station where you could provide limited public access. That might be one opportunity. Another is the extension of the Hudson River Trail connecting Yonkers down to Manhattan, something that's going to be a much larger, longer study, but something we are actively pursuing. So in other words, maybe you, obviously you can't break up the, the rail line, that's but right. you could say, hey, we can still do something with this area. That's precisely right. Um, Courtney, let's talk with you a little bit. And one of the things that, that I am, and I know uh, my viewers are, and people in the Bronx are self-conscious about, is plans going on without our input without mm -hmm. us having any say in them. But I guess you're, and you've been on the show before talking about these kinds of things, you're living proof that there was some outreach here. Yes. And, and right. uh, so tell me about the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance and the kind of input that you had into this process. Yeah, so Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance, we're an alliance now of over 600 organizations. We've grown by over 100 since, or close to 100 since I was here last, which is really exciting. How, how many in the Bronx? Can I just interrupt? Um, I think we have about 35 in the Bronx. Okay. Uh, we are a bi-state organization, so the harbor and the waterfront is, it doesn't respect boundaries. <laughs> it's the, the harbor is very big. Uh, and there are 525, 520 miles approximately of waterfront in New York City. Mm -hmm. So our, what we did is we actually worked on some legislation that required the Department of City Planning to start this whole process. And what was really important was that this plan wasn't written in an office, that the all of New York City, all the communities, the user groups, all of our alliance partners were able to say what it was that they wanted on the waterfront in New York City in specific areas and then also very generally. So one of the things though that's really unique about this this plan and um, it, it, it goes much farther than just how pretty it is, how good the waterfront looks. It's more and more it's about getting people to the water and into the water if possible. If into all, the water? If at all possible. Not swimming necessarily. Oh, There's a okay. whole, well, you can be in the water and be in a boat. <laughs> it's true. Uh, you can be on in, the water, I guess. You can, be be on a, you can be on a set of stairs that are very large that are f flooded by the water a little bit at high tide and you can be walking in that water. Mm -hmm. So there, there are lots of ways to provide people with a way of touching and getting into the water or being on the water. Talk to me about the process then of how that worked where uh, you could nudge your uh, colleague Michael there and say, hey, wait a minute, this is something that we would like to see. The city hasn't yet seen this, but maybe we should handle X, Y, and Z in this fashion. Well, going forward, what the city has in place is something called the Waterfront Management Advisory Board. And this is a mayoral level board that's going to advise the city and it's going to last past many administrations and it's going to tell the, uh, the city what it is that should be prioritized for waterfront projects. And it's a very important process that's going to be put into place. So we're working hard to make sure that that's going to be active and alive for mm -hmm. many, many years and to come. Is there an example of uh, a project or uh, something that's in the plan right now that you can say, hey, wait a minute, we really wanted to see that uh, and, and we put that in the plan? Something that comes to mind? That w that didn't get into the plan? No, or that, that did. That, that did get it. In other words, what, what did you say, you know what, we wanted this, oh, they yeah. weren't ready to do it, we pushed them and, and had, and, and now we have a collaboration. Well, group. there's almost, <laughs> there's a lot. Well, I think we counted up, I think, I think there are 45 or so direct yeah, recommendations. Give me an ex a Bronx example, I, either one of you can. I, I just think it would be interesting for people to know, ah, this was a good thing. Well, Michael, I think, that, actually, I think there was simultaneous discovery 
for a lot of the initiatives that came out of this plan. Mm -hmm. That the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance, along with many other advocates and local communities, all had a, many of the same desires and initiatives that they wanted to, to see. Mm -hmm. A lot of it had to do with public access to the waterfront, and as Courtney said, getting into the water. It's important to recognize that over the past 10, 20 years or so, the whole idea of recreation within the city has changed significantly. And the idea of going kayaking in the city's waters was unthinkable just a few decades ago. And yet now we have groups like the Bronx River Alliance that are organizing canoe trips on the Bronx River, a river that has had a remarkable recovery. And that was just something that just was would have been entirely out of the realm of possibilities just a couple of decades ago. Yeah, Although well, that, that had started, frankly, certainly. before this oh, absolutely. plan. I mean, the absolutely. Fo folks, are, we've been on this show for years talking about the Bronx River. Well, Go ahead. Well, what I'll just say specifically, uh, one of our programs that we've been working on that is in the plan is the importance of community docks. And uh, these are actually not docks the way you think of a dock on a lake. It's more like a floating barge, a small fo floating barge. And these, can, these are in the plan. They can be put in locations all over the city, and they not only accommodate big boats, which would be incredible, but they're also, they also accommodate kayaks and small human-powered vessels. So you can have a relatively inexpensive piece of infrastructure on the waterfront that accommodates a very wide range of boats. And this is really unique. This is great because uh, it can it can really open up the waterfront. Which Bronx waterfront might have something like that? And I want to piggyback that with which Bronx waterfront might have the other uh, sort of thing that you described, where uh, at high tide or a place yeah, where you right. can really get get wet with it, if you well, will. Well, um, there Barreto Park, Barreto Point Park. That's the best location we're looking at right now for a community eco dock, and that's an exciting location because it gets a lot of visitors. And it's also got, there's good access to, uh, to a dock if you were to put it there. So you could run a wide range of environmental programs and educational programs from that. Mm -hmm. There are also other... And do, and do you expect that that's going to happen? Uh, there's a picture right there of uh, Barreto Point yeah, Park. Right. Do you expect that that's going to happen in that spot? We are hope we're working on this actively Don't say right hope. now. <laughs> It'll happen. Oh, okay. um, and Michael, let's let's talk a little bit about something you said at the outset. You talked about it. It's Vision 2020. It's a 10-year plan. Now, obviously, this administration will be long gone at that point. It will be gone after a year or two. How does it work that this plan will then be adopted or, you know, kind of really seen to conclusion? Uh, in future administrations. It's very nice to put a plan out, but the right. next mayor could say, yeah, I didn't like that idea. That's right. Well, we were very cognizant of the, of the limited time remaining as we were writing this plan. We realized that as we were going to be releasing this plan, we had approximately three years left. And so we had, uh, our strategy included coming up with the action agenda, which, was a, which were 130 specific projects that were chosen to be catalysts that we would complete by the end of the administration, track our progress over the course of this administration, and then see those projects as a means of making certain that there was enough energy, excitement, and public support for these projects, for all of the rest of the projects to move forward over the next 10 years. Name a couple in the Bronx maybe that we're going to see within sure. the near future that our viewers would say, oh wow, that's very Well, good. a few of them have, have already come to come to fruition. I think one of them we saw the picture of already, the Barreto Point Park. Barreto Point Park's a great example of one of those parks that's just an absolutely fantastic new park. Um, but also uh, at uh, Orchard Beach, for instance. This past summer, we completed the, the uh, restoration of the sand there, um, putting more sand in place because of the constant erosion that it was facing. And part of that project included improving the south jetty so that it would serve as a protective measure to try to uh, reduce the amount of erosion that occurs there. Mm -hmm. So, that, so that's really part of what Courtney was saying. It's not just a matter of beautifying, it's also a matter of preserving and, and those kinds of things. That's is right. there, and, and we're going to show some more pictures, I mean, I, I love seeing those pictures, but um, is there a, an example of how economic development in the Bronx would be spurred on by, uh, by, through this uh, process? That's right. Well, obviously, Hunts Point and the Food, Food Distribution Center is one of the city's most important and critical uh, economic catalysts within the city, but it's also, uh, it, it's a jobs hub, but it's also an important way which the city works, that we get a lot of our food that, um, through, the, um, uh, through the Hunts Point mm -hmm. market. Um, part of what we're doing uh, as 
coming out of the comprehensive waterfront plan is uh, looking, and it's at this point still in the early study phases, is looking to see how we can increase the amount of goods, uh, food goods brought in by water. Um, that's something that's remarkably tricky, though. Uh, the benefits of moving goods by water is usually... Well, it's, it's obvious. I mean, you're it's, certainly it's, taking trucks off it, the bronze. It's obvious. Um, one of the things, though, is that the the economic benefits to moving goods by water pays off most when you're moving heavy goods slowly, and that's pretty much the opposite of what you what need you when need. you're distributing so, food. So is that something that could be done and could be developed? And then the other challenge, of course, is developing the harbors, which requires some uh, cash. That's et cetera, right. Et cetera. That it's something that we're continuing to look at. Um, this At this point, it's too early to say if it's going to be truly feasible, but it is something that we, we are looking at seriously. And, and what about the whole notion of money? Everybody says, you know what, let, this is wonderful. There's a million ideas out there. We've talked about all kinds of ideas. Uh, and it, during this period of time where there's cutbacks to all, all kinds of vital services and personnel, how do we justify uh, and where do we find the money to spend right. on projects like this. So in the action agenda, those 130 projects that I spoke of, those had funding sources uh, committed to them, totaling approximately $3.3 .3 billion, which is an incredibly impressive amount of money. A significant portion of that money is coming from the Department of Environmental Protection and the water rates that are received uh, by through DEP. And those will be going towards improving water quality, which is obviously a critical goal to talk about when we're thinking more broadly about improving the water. Is there climate. concern that as we go to the future, some of those funding sources might dry up because, um, you know, uh, we know that the economy is that's quite rebounded. That's yet. certainly correct. And we have to look uh, far and wide for funding sources. I would say just one thing is that as we're thinking about these improvements on the waterfront, we have to not think about them as expenditures, but thinking of them as investments. And that's a critical distinction because what we pay into our waterfront, we return back in spades. Is that a concern for you that here we have all these great ideas and the, the $3.3 .3 billion is there, but guess what? Mayor Bloomberg's administration will end and maybe the commitment by the next administration is not there. Yeah, it's a huge concern, uh, but I think it's uh, it's something that the advocacy community needs to pay attention to and I think I think we'll be all right if we do pay attention to it. I think that one of the really important things to say um, about what can be possible for the waterfront in a bad economy is that we can move projects forward in terms of the ideas that we have for them and how and and the designs that we'd want for projects so that once the money is available there's a place to put the money. I think some of the problems have been that the, we don't have a vision for the waterfront. We haven't had a vision well, for the waterfront. We water. did have we one. Did, but we, we but also, one. The, you can have a vision, but then you also need the next set of plans to make that vision real. And sometimes the money has been available and there haven't been projects to put the money to. Do, so. you, do you think that this process, and I'm guessing the answer is obviously yes, this process has brought uh, all these groups together so that when one administration goes, you'll still have yes, a cohort that's together happened. ready to advocate. That's really, really happened, and that's one of the greatest achievements of this. But the other really neat thing about it is that this process involved everyone from the industrial community, the working waterfront community, to the environmental advocates and everything in between. And so for the first time ever, this entire group saw each other as a consistent constituency. And they never thought of that before. And, that's, and that means that there's going to be strength moving forward. Uh, let's show some of the photographs. Uh, I know there was, there was uh, one, I think the first one is to take a look at some of the people. Now, they, uh, Michael, you want to describe what these folks uh, are doing? Uh, yes, this is actually um, just south of, this photo is taken just south of High Bridge. And the, uh, this is a group of MIT students. There was an MIT studio conducted in the spring looking at the Harlem River and coming up with creative ideas for how to increase public access to the waterfront and they had input into the plan as well. Well, actually, their work came a bit after. Um, they, uh, right after the plan came out, uh, an MIT professor contacted me asking if I had thoughts as to where his studio should focus their efforts. Oh, there you go, and you and said, why not? Exactly, and I said, the Harlem River in the Bronx. Perfect. You know, you, you brought up the Harlem River. I, I want to ask you something about it. I mean, I went through as much of the, the plan which you have there. It's 192 yes. pages. It's rather extensive. Um, but I, I, there is a very active group advocating for that Harlem River waterfront. 
I didn't see a lot about, in fact, anything about the Holland River uh, in the plan. Did I miss something? Uh, I think you did. We had uh, several strategies specifically related to the Harlem River, and we identify about six or seven sites on there. Where Give me one. Well, uh, one site that's actually already coming to fruition, are, uh, it's the site referred to as the uh, the Tabernacle uh, mm -hmm. Choir site, where it's uh, it's o sites uh, sites on the waterfront that had been owned by a church for a great number of years. The Trust for Public Land just this uh, past year have acquired that site, and in October they turned it over to the Parks Department, um, where to be used for, for parkland. For parkland. And where is that located? Uh, it's on the Harlem River. Uh, it's just uh, I'm now. It's uh, put south it right of on the spot there. yes. It's uh, south of Highbridge, um, north of uh, McCombs Dam. McCombs Dam yeah. and Yankee Stadium. All right, let's uh, take a look at some of the other uh, pictures. I know Jane has some uh, racked up there that we can take a look at. Now, this is obviously the flotilla, uh, which you heartily endorse. Is there something that you're going to be able to do to support this, or this is really going by itself? Well, uh, uh, certainly the Bronx River Alliance and the Parks Department deserve a ton of credit for all the work that they have done on uh, on the Bronx River in improving water quality um, and improving access. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we have coming out of the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan is expanding what the city refers to as the, uh, uh, as the not the Harbor Way, I'm forgetting the... Mm -hmm. The water trail? The water trail, thank you. Okay. Um, the water trail, which is the city's name for the, the interconnection of all of the kayaking and canoeing launch sites throughout the city. Mm -hmm. And those are, there are right now approximately seven sites in the Bronx. In the plan, we recommend a great number of other sites that could be opportunities for increased access so that you could launch your canoe at, uh, let's say, at the, uh, at the Bronx River, take it downstream, take it out into the harbor, and, and land somewhere else. We, nice which currently you can't really do. That's you right. wanted to add well, something to that? Uh, just at a, at a high, um, more of a macro level, one of the things that's really interesting about New York City is that it has this enormous waterfront, but there's no waterfront department. The waterfront responsibilities are spread out over many, many different departments, and everybody's doing a very good job. But, but events and um, recreation on the waterfront is one thing that it could be it could be more standardized across agencies. Sure, it, it could be, be a more within a, a couple. It could be in planning. It could also yeah, be in parks, right. obviously, and, and, so, and some of the other. Uh, so you asked if, if uh, what the city's doing to support the flotilla, which is a lot in terms of just m allowing it to happen. And we need to make sure that over time we're making it easier and easier for communities to use waterfronts for events, to get on the water, to use to have programs programming and that type of thing. We want to eliminate red tape. We want to make it easier for people to understand where to go to make sure that they can have fun on the waterfront. Let's uh, uh, pop up a couple of the other uh, photographs that we hear. Um, and th this is, go ahead, Michael. Sure. This is uh, a group from the Harbor School, which is located now on Governor's Island. And they are planting uh, oyster spats, which are uh, baby oysters that will be uh, growing on these cages in the harbor. And this is just an example of one of the things that we talk about in the, in the plan, which is, uh, which is supporting the blue network, the, the term we use for the waterways themselves. Mm -hmm. And having the waterways be part of not only our transportation system, but also our educational system. Let, let's uh, pop a couple of the others up there. Now, th these next couple, now this was in interesting to me. Uh, this is, I guess, looking at north at the High Bridge, right? That's right. Oh, the, uh, this is the Harlem River Promenade. Um, right. One of the ideas of connecting um, segments of the, uh, of the of, Harlem River. Of course, my concern would be that's on the Manhattan side. I'd love to see a nice photograph of uh, what it might look like on the Bronx side. Well, and actually, there, there are a couple of uh, uh, well, certainly the MIT studio did some great renderings of what the Bronx River, er, excuse me, the Harlem River on the Bronx side could look like. Mm -hmm. There's also the important next step, which is the Trust for Public Land and the Parks Department are going to be working together now. They recently announced um, that the Trust for Public Land has received uh, uh, some funding to pursue a strategic plan for the Harlem River on the Bronx side, coming up with an interconnection for a greenway mm -hmm. along the. Should the that Harlem have been side. part of this plan? If we had, she was about to react. Oh, you can go, say, yeah, go ahead. You can go. Oh, I was just going to say, if we had um, the time and the resources um, as we were preparing the plan, we certainly would have integrated it in. Um, absent that, I think that actually was the, a lot of the ideas that 
came out of Vision 2020 that spurred first mm -hmm. the MIT studio and now the work of the Trust for Public. Yeah. And well, you wanted to react also, and I well, want to put I would, up one more photo. Go ahead. I just want to say that uh, the, the plan is a great achievement, and it's a great achievement considering the size of the, the, uh, the department that actually uh, did the work and the number of waterfront miles we have. It's, it's a great, it, it receives some national attention, and so we're really pleased with the results. I think the challenge is going to be, and this is what we're getting to, is that it's taking the plan and really working from that to have very much more specific ideas about what we're going to do. I, uh, throw up that, uh, <coughs> the last picture that we have, and this uh, to me was is, is a lovely uh, photograph. No, is this an artist or is this a no, photograph? This is, this is a photograph. This is uh, an example of also uh, on the Harlem River uh, on the Manhattan side, but this is an example of one of the things that we, we need to see more of in the city. And this is exactly what I was talking about with being able to put your feet on a, on a step Right. That might be covered. There is a section here where that's possible on the Manhattan and, and side. And you know that my follow-up question to this is going to be: This again is on the Manhattan side. I mean, I look through. I, I give you one one long list: waterfront action agenda projects to spur reinvestment in the waterfront, Brooklyn Army Terminal, Brooklyn Bridge Park, Brooklyn Navy Yard, Edgemere and Queens, Hunters Point South and Queens, Stuyvesant Cove. Lower Manhattan. I didn't see well, one thing from the Bronx here, and as I looked through it, I was dying to see somebody <laughs> say, "Wow, this is!" And I'd love to see a spectacular, real-life picture of what we just saw, but in the Bronx. There's a lot of work to be done in the Bronx, absolutely. That's and what and Michael, but uh, but to Michael's credit, he's the one who who directed MIT to the Harlem River on the Bronx side and saw that there was this huge discrepancy between what's going on in the Manhattan side and what should be happening on the Bronx side. I, I'm and, just advocating yeah. for uh, what this show has been about for Which 17 is the years. <laughs> I, I would argue actually that um, we shouldn't try to pit the boroughs against each other because well, the I fact agree. of the matter is that there needs to be significant investments across the waterfront. Um, the, this, the Bloomberg administration has made tremendous investments along the waterfront uh, throughout all five boroughs. And the Bronx alone, uh, not just on the waterfront, but throughout the Bronx in the Bloomberg administration, we spent $600 million on parks alone. Um, that's an incredible investment that we've made. Should it be more? Absolutely. You know, we're continuing to strive for, uh, strive you, for better. You've heard, and I know you've heard, the call of the various Bronx groups who are saying, you know what, we want more. And, and uh, what Courtney said, I think, is a tremendous sign, and that is that you pointed the M MIT people. So what may be missing, I'm guessing you would say, can still be done. Absolutely. That, and these things take time. Um, building on the waterfront is expensive. There are a tremendous number of regulations that make every step a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but we could look at other examples, certainly here in the Bronx, where projects have come to fruition. Well, almost out of time. Um, you want to say something Well, I, I do. I just want to get really quickly back to the oysters and just make sure every Be viewer understands that the, the water is completely alive with amazing amounts of aquatic creatures that are looking for better homes. <laughs> so there's a, an ecological if part people, to this too. If, if uh, individuals or groups or community boards and others want to contact you or have input into what they've seen on the show, how do they do that? Uh, you should visit our website, www.waterfrontalliance.org, and you can get in touch with us on our staff page. And we are also, our website is full of information, so you can search for any term and find great stuff. And uh, also for the city, uh, I'm assuming you're, you're listening. That's absolutely correct. Uh, you can visit our website where you can download the entire plan, nyc.gov slash planning. Uh, and you could download the plan, read everything that you would want to read about the Bronx and elsewhere. Got it. We've we got to run. Okay. Michael Morella from the City Department thank of Planning, you. thank you. And Courtney Worrell from uh, MWA, thank you. And folks, if you have further comments or questions on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, then email them to us at bronxtalk at hotmail.com. And we'll read those on the air during a future edition of our program. Archives of Bronx Talk are available at bronxnet.org. You click Bronx Talk on the right-hand navigation bar. Now, next week, January 23rd, we'll check in with Councilman Fernando Cabrera. Should be a good show, as always. Bronx Talk, Monday nights here at 9 on Bronxnet, Cablevision 67, Verizon Fios Channel 33. Thanks to our producer, Jane Floro, director Michael Arias, our cast of thousands up in the booth. And uh, to you, good night.